Welcome to this episode of Robots in Depth. Today I'm honored to have Asim Prakash here from Center for Innovating the Future in Toronto, Canada. So my focus really is on what future with robotics looks like rather than just future of robotics. Very interesting, very interesting. We have to think about what future we want and, uh, and shape it to take most advantage of the developments within robotics. Correct. Can you tell me how you got started in robotics? Well, <laughs> you know, robotics is not one of those areas that I was schooled in or I went to uh, work in a lab or work for a company. But as I started my journey into understanding how tomorrow is unfolding. Which is it's such a good word, tomorrow is unfolding. That's exactly what it's doing, right? Right. So one of the things that, uh, that is obvious is that the whole field of robotics, and of course robotics includes both hardware, software, and I'll throw in another uh, variable within robotics, and that's platforms. So, so the word robotics really is hardware, software, platforms. So when you're looking at how tomorrow is coming our way and what the future might look like, robotics is there, along with, say, designer genes, along with uh, nanotechnologies, material innovations, and so on and so forth. So I have been looking into this whole area of robotics and trying to understand what is going on for several years. Mm. The important thing there is that I'm more, as I said earlier, I'm interested in what future with robotics looks like rather than just future of robotics. Mm. Very, how the society integrates with them and how we are going to use them as people. Precisely. So precisely yeah. that uh, what does tomorrow look like with this whole field of robotics. Mm, very and, interesting. And, 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 and within that, I'm also interested, my view is, so what should be our strategy? If, if robots or artificial intelligence or various platforms are coming our way, what should be the strategy? How do we respond to opportunities as well as challenges? Because there are going to be multiple of both, right? Multiple of both. Mo lots of opportunities, lots of challenges. Correct. And, and they will be different for individuals, different for businesses, different for nations. So, so that's where the Strategy Innovation Lab, Center for Innovating the Future, comes in, in terms of what should be the strategy. How do we innovate a brand new strategy to stay relevant and stand tall? in what I call the next machine age. Absolutely, You're, th th this is so important work. And I think it's also work that is somehow forgotten because it, it, it's, uh, we're so busy evolve, developing the robots and looking at hardware and software that we forget how to integrate this in organizations or in society or in our daily lives. Right, so I recently talked about coexisting with robots. So. I've been thinking and, and, and talking about coexisting with robots for some time, but I recently was on a lecture series. And uh, one thing is very clear that we are going to coexist, not with one, not with two, but dozens, perhaps even hundreds of robots. Absolutely. In, inside absolutely. of our homes, inside of our businesses, and outside in society, outside in our communities. Mm. and. So coexisting with robots is no longer an intellectual conversation. It's no longer an option. It's here. Now, the question is, what does that look like? How do we prepare for it? And how do we make it work for us? And, and it's not just all about how do we make robots work for us. It will also be about how, and this is the most fascinating as well as frightening part of it is, that we humans will have to not adopt or adapt to this new entity called ro robots. Mm. That's absolutely, that happens with every technology that it improves our lives, but it also changes them. We have to adapt to them. Right. Like today, you can't just walk around in a city the way you wanted to. In the old days, we have pedestrian crossings because we've got cars, right? right. right. If you behaved like you did before cars, you'd be run over, right? Right. I think the 
the important thing also is that uh, the machines, we humans have coexisted with machines, of all kinds of machines for a very long time. But for the first time, so for example, you know, we have coexisted with machines, say a car. You and I had to get inside a car to drive it, to turn it on, to drive it. Mm -hmm. Because the car could not act on its own, not yet anyway. No. And so the behavior and action of the car were determined by our commands mm. and our desires. But with robotics, it's not just that ro robots are going to be determined by our actions, which of course they are. Mm. But technology is taking them to a place where we can have a human-like conversation with the machine, which is, when you think about it, that in itself is such a radical, dramatic shift that we can have for the first time in the journey of humanity, have a conversation with a non-human. Yeah, but yeah. have a human-like conversation. Yeah, yeah, and uh, th that's as you say. We, 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 the the machine talks back to us. The car doesn't. Right. Uh, we are on top of the car, but we are next to the robot. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And 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 then of course, you know, once we have a conversation, like you and I are having a conversation, that leads to a better understanding of one one another or. Uh, other person, and that leads to bonding, friendship, uh, all types of different types trust, of trust, which is trust, important, uh, and all types of relationships. Mm -hmm. So you know there have been talks, and I definitely believe that humans will fall in love mm -hmm. with the machine. They will develop an intimate relationship with the machine. And we already see that to a certain degree uh, when 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 the robots were used in in bomb disposal and they were sure. of course regularly blown up and sure. uh, the service the, the 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 field technician then would bring it back to the center for service and then, then the the service technician would say nah it's too destroyed you get a new one no 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 you got to fix this one right. <laughs> uh, they get they bond with that robot absolutely because it, it's out there it's helping them every day so right, right. and there is mm. another dimension to it is that there are going to be certain types of robots. For example, a robotic hand helping someone lift things which they couldn't do before. Mm. Augmenting or, the human. Uh. Augmenting the human or or a special purpose ex, uh, exoskeleton that that's being used, say, in a construction industry mm. for heavy lifting and all that stuff. Mm. So, so, so it's different forms of relationship. Coexisting with robots, that's what my call it passion focus mm -hmm. is the the implications the dimensions are varied mm -hmm. and they're huge and 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 that's that's where it just begins to get more and more exciting and 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 sometimes challenging mm -hmm. and and it's a fast moving area and that's that's also catching all of us by surprise that mm -hmm. the speed i've started saying that 2016 has become 2022 in, in the sense that... It is in one way, it is yeah, in one way, absolutely. That, that we were talking about some of these things happening, oh, well, sometimes around 2022, mm -hmm. 2025, maybe around beyond. Mm -hmm. and, and as you just mentioned, that some of this the developments in AI or in machine learning may actually materialize in a proper way by then. Mm -hmm. But if you also look at the speed with which these things have have already arrived. Yeah, it's like amazing. It's almost like the the next decade is already here. Yeah, it feels like living in the future. Right. Especially when you see what's nearly possible. Right. When you see what's around the corner, you're just amazed. Right. Say, this works very well already. Yeah. It's like the Tesla self-driving car. It's far from perfect. Sure. Uh, but it is very impressive, right? Sure, absolutely. And uh, you know, one of the things that I always share and, and remind people is that when the first iPhone came, there were people in the technology industry and telecommunications industry who, who did not believe in the phone, who, who just ridiculed it in, mm. in, a, in a way. But now if you look at iPhone, <laughs> It's, it's uh, you can't live your life without a smartphone, no. whether it is iPhone or some other mm. 
And so we have to remain open to new possibilities. Mm, mm. And, and right now, the, the, the next, call it a tool, call it uh, transform, transformational technology, call it however you want to define it, mm. I think robotics is the next uh, major uh, development. Absolutely, especially since, as you say, it's already happening now in strength. Right. We're actually seeing robotic systems changing the world, changing the way we live today. Right. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that is, I think, catching everybody by surprise is the speed with which these things are developing. Mm. And, uh, and, and it's not just the speed of technological development by itself. Mm. It's also the speed with which the application of the technology, how that technology can be applied. Mm, mm, mm. And another very interesting variable is that this is not a phenomenon of one culture or one part of the world. This is happening now all over the world. Mm, mm, mm. So that, that Yeah, all over the world. Robotics is very, very d diverse that way, that there's developments going on in all, more all or less every country. All over the world. And you know, I've been um, looking into robotics in India, mm -hmm. and uh, and it astonishes me because we we tend to think of India as a land of software mm -hmm. and outsourcing because that's what India has been uh, mostly focused on. Mm -hmm. But if you now look at India and start navigating robotics in India, mm -hmm. uh, you will be very pleasantly surprised, sometimes even shocked that uh, the speed with which robotics is developing mm. inside India mm. and, and most of it is being done by people of India, in India, for India. Mm, mm, mm. Because uh, in India has many unique challenges. Uh, can you talk, uh, talk a little bit about the interesting projects you've seen uh, that they're working on in India right now? Yeah, so let me um, give you an example. So, so there is a company that is developing a humanoid robot um, for six hundred dollars. Yeah, that's a good price. Okay, so already the the concept of frugal robotics is taking shape inside India. Um, there is a, a, a student innovation. So they've created a robot for the ICU for hospitals mm. to help the medical staff who are taking care of patients who are in ICU. Mm. Um, there's another, com uh, actually it's an educational institute that has developed a mobile robot for deep mining, which can keep track of the air quality and, and other variables inside the mine. Mm. A and modern canary, so to speak. Yeah, yeah and, and then in real time, create a 3D map of what's taking place and, and let the miners know whether it is safe to go forward or, or to stop. So, so this is already happening. And another very interesting example is that drones are being used to supply human organs mm. for people needing transplant and, and, and because of the traffic problems. Every uh, city have them. Uh, right, but India's traffic problems are pretty chronic. And, and, and because of the distances. Hmm. Um, so drones are being used uh, for that. Um, Very interesting, yeah. A um, lot of work going on in the field of AI, um, whether it is chatbots, whether it is AI platform, and so on and so forth. Linking so, it to the outsourcing, uh, trend that has been a big thing in India for, for a number of years. Huh? Yes, but I think in terms of outsourcing, the only area, the major area of outsourcing that I have been able to kind of assess is in the area of self-driving cars. Ah, okay. So, you know, the sure, there, there are a couple of Indian companies that are attempting, one actually has built up a prototype of a self-driving vehicle that can seat up to 14 people. Mm, like a mini bus rather like a mini than bus. a car. Right, right. right. And uh, so, but if you look at what's really happening within that space, mm. uh, you will see that a lot of companies in India are developing either software or a small component 
for self-driving cars mm -hmm. and, and car companies from overseas. Yeah, yeah. So that's about the only area of outsourcing that I'm aware of mm -hmm. um, within robotics. Mm -hmm. um, the Another very interesting thing pair in all of this is that, you know, I mean, there are, you need about four things to make these, any, any of these things ha happen. Mm -hmm. You need money, mm -hmm. you need technology, you need customers or market, and you need talent, right? Mm. So India has so many problems, which are all opportunities. Mm. So you already have a, a market. Yeah, uh, there's a need out there that isn't met today, right? Right, and and then you you have talent. Um, Certainly, India has that. Right, um, and then now technology is is. Uh, um, geography agnostic mm. the technology is available to anybody anywhere mm. and in the last couple of years one of the very interesting thing that has happened is that a lot of money uh, both from abroad and from within India and from Asia as well um, is coming to India mm. so you know many people may or may not be aware of it that in 2015 India uh, became the number one nation in the world for foreign investment. Mm. And then we're talking high tech uh, industries then, I would presume, right? No, it's it's all types of areas because mm. India is pretty big right now on make in India. Mm. Uh, India looks, is thinking that manufacturing uh, is, is one way of creating jobs, because India has to create a lot of jobs. Yeah, it's a big country. <laughs> right, so a few million jobs won't go that yeah, far in a country it's a that size. It's a nation of 1.3 billion people. Yeah. And about 12... Many, many of them young, I would presume, needing a new new job and a new future. Yeah, and you know, I mean, uh, different numbers are there, but uh, the majority of India is uh, under 35. Mm, that's amazing, right. especially coming from Sweden and in a European context where we are more or less the the opposite thing, where most of us are old. So, <laughs> yeah. So India is a very young nation in mm. that in that sense, mm. and An enormous uh, force is buried in that when they start developing. Right, because what is happening is that that young generation that is becoming the mainstream. It has mm. become the mainstream. Mm. Um, they do not want old dysfunctional systems or technologies to be in front of them. In that case in point uh, that perhaps you, you, may, you may already be aware of is that Apple recently tried to sell refurbished <laughs> phones <laughs> into India. That didn't go very well. No, it did not. It did not. Mm. And, and, and behind that mm. is the young India, mm. the new India, that that doesn't want to deal with doesn't want to be treated as second rate citizens of the world that no. doesn't and that doesn't by anybody not just outsiders but by their own uh, companies from within india mm. and they want the best they want the most modern mm. and and that pressure mm. will and is already driving a lot of companies in india to go towards robotics mm. Because it's a new field, it's a new they, field. They, nobody dominates it yet. This right. open for grabs for anybody, right? And it's also so big. There's even if you would face competition, it's going to be space enough there for everyone for a very long time, right? Absolutely. So, so those things are happening, and 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 that makes things um, incredibly interesting. Mm. 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 So, so robotics is developing in different parts of the world very, very interesting, in mm. some very interesting ways. Yeah. You're looking at then co-robotics, uh, and you're trying to map the future so that we can adapt it to, to, to the future we actually want, rather than that we would just get randomly. Can you talk a little bit about that process you use? How would a company or say we have a company, we have an organization, uh, uh, maybe a government body, they want to use this technology to look at their future and their, how, how will their operations be uh, affected by robotics over the coming five or 15 or 20 years? How can they use this and could you help them do that? Sure, so my approach is, uh, I, I'm always saying this, you, if you want to profit from the future or protect your existing legacy. Mm. 
you have to, first of all, innovate a brand new strategy because the context has changed. Hmm. You cannot look to the past and you cannot repackage the present. Hmm. So anybody, any organization approaching strategy through those filters will have a challenging time navigating the future that is already here. Mm. So the, now the question becomes if the past is no longer a reliable guide and you can no longer repackage the present, so how should you go about it? So my approach always is start with the new map of tomorrow. The only day you can change is tomorrow, right? Right, but, but not only that, because the new map of tomorrow, whenever people talk about the future, they make the, um, I think, a miscalculation of thinking, well, the future is out there, five, 10, 15, 20 years out there. And sure, that is one way of looking at the future, but the way I'm trying to um, share with the world, share with people, share with the organization in this context is, that the future we are talking about is already here. And then I give them examples. So going back to robotics, the first thing to do is to start with map of the next machine age. So I have developed a map of the next machine age. What does the next machine age look like? Um, because there are a lot of people are not even 100% uh, sure what the difference is between say cognitive computing and AI and machine learning. And if you're not clear on some of these concepts, because many of these concepts are being overused and freely used and perhaps even wrongly. Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, Especially about. AI, for instance, is not widely understood uh, right. in its current context. Right. So what happens is that that if if you are an executive uh, head of an agency and you're trying to make some decisions about your uh, the future of your uh, operations mm. and and you're not 100% sure what the differences are then either you're not going to do it because it's just you're not sure how to navigate it or in some in some cases you may end up making a wrong choice mm. and 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 both are not going to be helpful because if you don't take action and this is another thing is that just because somebody is going to sit on the fence and wait for the results or wait for the best practices to emerge, the technology and markets are moving so, so fast that you're not going to get left behind, but you're now running the risk of absolutely destroying your legacy. Mm. And it's also so that even if, if these best practices and those general guidance things develop, you have to relate to your organization and your problem. Exactly. You have to do your own homework. So that is ready then when, when, when implementation becomes possible. Exactly. I mean, take a look at again, going back to Apple, and I'll come back to what my approach is. Mm -hmm. uh, take a look at Apple. I think many companies around the world have tried to copy the playbook of Apple. Mm. And nobody has been able to no. to imitate Apple <laughs> or even come close to Apple in any shape and form. Mm. Because companies who are trying to copy Apple, they're forgetting one thing. And that is that the context in which Apple is operating is very different than the context that they're operating in because everybody's context is very different. Mm. And the variables, the way Apple is navigating the variables is unique to Apple. Mm. So this, we, we have come through a world of business where copying the playbook of the market leader, uh, taking cues from the best practices of companies that have done successfully would, was sufficient. Mm. And I'm, I will argue that that world is no longer applicable because markets, technology, and various variables are shifting so rapidly that if you're not innovating your own future, you're too far behind. You're too far behind. You are, if you're not innovating your own future on your terms, you are now running the risk, not of getting disrupted, mm -hmm. but primarily destroying your legacy. Yeah, being replaced, basically. Exactly. Mm. You, and, you, and you can't uh, have somebody else do it for you. You have to do it because otherwise it won't be ready in time, right? Exactly. So 
so going back to that, so I start with talking about what the new map of the next machine age mm. is, because getting your head around what this next machine age looks like is the first step of understanding what is it we are getting into, mm. or what is it that has arrived at our doorstep. Mm. 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 Right, with, with that level of understanding, what is the impact of what we are dealing with here? Mm. Again, I talk about strategy uh, point of view. And I always ask this, this question, have you ever dealt with a chat bot? Have you dealt with a chat bot to serve a customer or sell through a chat bot? Mm. The answer is no, because this is such a new thing. Mm. So the existing strategy or the way you built your strategy in the past mm. is not going to work because now one of the, and, and chat bot is just one of the various variables mm. Mm. that have popped up. Mm. And, uh, and, and you have to, build a strategy with those variables now. Mm. And so when you understand the next machine age, then you have a better understanding of what is it that you have to prepare yourself for. Mm. Mm. And you have to immerse yourself in these new technologies and really uh, absorb them and integrate them into your uh, context and then draw conclusions from that. Absolutely. Mm. And then what also, uh, and, and through that process, once you understand what the next machine age looks like, um, then my m process in, in helping an organization or an agency is to then figure it out. So what should be our place or our vision in this next machine age? And whatever they want to call it. I call it the next machine age. Somebody else may want to call it whatever they want to call it. That's Age of robotics or something right, like that. But right, I, I right. like the next machine age because I still think we should separate machines and robots from humans. They're, they're still machines. And I like the, the next machine age because that also sounds less scary than robotics because we know machines, right? <laughs> we have machines all over. Sure. Right? We use them for everything, right? Sure. And, 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 and once you have figured that one out, then obviously the next step is, so what is my place mm -hmm. in the next machine age? What is What should be my vision? And then the third step, of course, is what should be my strategy? How do I innovate my future in this new environment, as I just said? Mm -hmm. If you're going to wait for somebody else to show you results, then you're not it. just running the risk of being disrupted. I keep saying that because it's such an important part of, of the message that I share with the world is if you're not taking action right now, if you're not preparing yourself for the next machine age, if you're not investing in it either by learning about the next machine age or doing something, you're not just running the risk of being disrupted, you're running the risk of having your legacy being destroyed. Mm. Because the speed with which these things are happening the speed with which these things are happening all over the world, and the creativity and innovation that is going inside of these things in terms of applications and problem solving and, and dealing with complex challenges of society and humanity and business, um, it's, those things are happening at a, such a fast pace that anybody who is sitting in the comfort of status quo is just going to have a very tough time. Yeah, yeah. It's like you jumping on a running. Uh, it's like uh, uh, trying to jump on a train that's already running. It's more likely to kill you than gets you on the trip. So Absolutely. Get on the train early and, and, and relate this to your context, your organization, your company, and, and, and learn how to look at new technologies and evaluate them. Is this relevant for me? Maybe not. Maybe it is. And OK, so this technology is something that's relevant for my organization but how do I adapt it to my needs? Right. What are my customers thinking? What are my users thinking? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Mm. In fact, mm. uh, one of the things that companies can immediately begin to do is uh, they, can, they can do a brainstorming session. So I, I recently talked about it and I said, will you be Ubered? In other words- Yeah, answer that you, question and we can go on. Uh, right, will you be disrupted? And, and if so, what will disrupt you? Mm -hmm. you and know? can we do that thing ourselves? Can we do that thing ourselves? Yeah. Or, or when you go, go to your weekly meeting next week, mm. um, 
try asking this question with your teammates. Mm. What is our strategy for the next machine age? Mm. And the way the discussion flows and the outcomes that come out or not come out is a clear indication how prepared a company is for the next machine age, how prepared they are to coexist with robots. Mm. So, mm. so, so these are the ways I am focused on, on not only defining the new map of the next machine age, but in terms of what can it do for a company and, and how I can uh, add value. Mm -hmm. So we're talking, I like this, that we're coming to the practical things because we should tell people what to do practically and schedule a meeting re soon and ask these questions. Will I be Ubered? How am I going to, how are this organization and this company going to prepare itself for coexisting and, and using robotics? We've now identified a few areas in our organization and company that we think um, could use your robotics. What do I do then? How do I approach this field? Well, the, the, look, at the end of the day, every organization is driven by growth, customers, revenue. How can I use the world of robotics, both hardware, software, platform, to reinvent value as far as my own offerings are concerned? Mm, 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 mm. Okay. Asking uh, yourself these questions and, and finding out the answer is, is just right. fundamental. Huh? Right. And, and that's the kind of work I do with, with companies is, is to help them navigate these questions and come up with answers that are relevant to their context, that are relevant to their needs. Mm, mm. Uh, and uh, so, you know, perhaps for somebody who has been very focused on hardware, uh, there is a huge opportunity now with uh, providing service offerings in the form of analytics. And, and, and here, here, here is an example. We have been talking about Internet of Things um, and, and self-driving cars for quite some time now, at least for the last two to three years in mm. all kinds of uh, conversations. So say you, you are a business who sells tractors to farmers mm. and you have uh, autonomous technology in the tractors coupled with some sensors, of course, and, and so on and so forth. So what else can you do, right? Because now suddenly you're going to collect so much data, right? Mm. Now you have to start figuring it out. What do I do with this data? Yeah, how do we use data from one user and another user and we together bring this and then we look at it and say, how, what's actually going on out there? Because with the old style of products, if you had a regular tractor, you don't know much about how the customer is using it. Right. And when it's when it maybe there is a limitation you can remove and your customer can use it in a better way. Right. But when you get all this data, you can actually see how the customer is using your 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 equipment and you can then optimize your uh, your improvement and your development to actually target the area where the user wants the improvement. Absolutely. And and but if you look at it from a company standpoint that when you're getting all this data and you're aggregating it, you, and, and if you have a strategy, then you can turn the data and create a services business out of it. Mm. And then you can sell a bunch of services back to farmers in terms of what is happening with their land, what is happening with their crop, what is happening with the climate, what is the impact of certain type of climate on their crop. Mm. Now, farmers know all those things intuitively and based on experience, mm. but now you are complementing a lot of what they already know with hard facts, core data, mm. so that when a farmer is frustrated why a crop did not yield as much mm. despite all the hard work, mm. you're able to throw some data in front of the mm. person. Mm. You're also able to throw the data about the condition of the of the ground. To, so, so there are so many variables. But mm. important thing is going back to the company mm. and creating value through through the world of robotics is that you can use these types of technologies to start reinventing value, mm. right? And, and, and third area, of course, is where a lot of, lot of companies have, have, I would say a lot of Fortune 500 style companies have made a lot of investments and that is redefining work, the future of work that is being talked about. Mm. But I'm not sure if 
companies across the world have really spent time and say, okay, what does the future of work look inside my organization? You know, again, I talk about the concept of um, or technology of telepresence robots. It's a no-brainer. Mm. You know, if there is one, call it piece of technology mm. <laughs> within robotics, mm. that is absolutely no-brainer, mm. is a telepresence robot. Mm -hmm. You and see so many of them, and they do offer a unique service, huh? Right, right. And, and with a telepresence robot, you can begin to redefine your work because now you can have a remote workforce which is live mm. in your face mm. and, and you can collaborate with that workforce in real time. Mm. Mm. Um, you, uh, so as you begin to apply things like telepresence robots, um, you begin to rethink what work means, who does what, where. Mm. At what time? Yeah, the time thing is, I think, is time and geography is a very important and uh, interesting aspect of that. I think that you can also move this workforce instantly between two wildly separate locations. If there is a situation that appears in one of your other right. shops, for instance, uh, you could immediately bring a lot of people in there. Right. Um, I heard of one good example is that when you have a delayed aircraft in an airport, uh, you need to help assist all these passengers that either they need a hotel reserved, they might need to be guided quickly to their next to their next gate so that they can make that short connection, uh, or they might simply need to be rescheduled. And you can't have people sitting waiting at the airport for a delayed flight. Sure. But here you can have telepresence robots that can come in and personally, with a human, guide each and individual passenger uh, in that tricky situation. Great example. Mm. Another great example of fast, quick, and, and the deployment of these types of solutions is not huge because you're not really changing, for example, in the case of this delayed, delayed mm. flight and using telepresence robots to come and guide passengers, you're not really changing your processes in any fundamental way. No, you do the same work anyway, just right. in another way, right? Right, you're just, you're just using technology in a smart, creative way mm, mm. to solve an existing problem, mm. right? Mm. So, so these are the types of things that I am asking companies to start thinking about because this is here. Mm. And the sooner you do, and, and implementing these things is complex, it's mm. not, it's not easy. Mm. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it, yeah. of course. Um, but because it is difficult, mm. because it is challenging, hence everybody should start thinking about these things mm. because it is going to affect everybody. Mm. And if you're the one succeed, if you're the one that really works hard and gets through these challenges and gets through them the f first uh, and also iterates quickest you're more more likely to come out on top of this rather than struggling behind. Uh. Sure, because you're, you're going to have a better understanding of how to navigate the next machine age. Mm. You will have a better understanding of how do these technologies work. Mm. You will have a better understanding of what coexisting with robots means. Mm. You will have a better understanding of how the deployment of robotic technologies inside your business is affecting humans, cultures, processes, your strategy, your in conversations, everything. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And the, f the, f the few examples I have of large scale introduction of, of robotics in different organizations have been slightly reluctant before it happens, slightly odd when it happens, but really quickly after it happened, everybody was just saying, why this guy's got a robot helping him, why can't I have one? Sure. So this is mostly gonna be a positive experience for all uh, management and, and everybody involved in it, if you do it right. Yes, and, and, and not only it's doing it right, but doing it in a way that people who are affected, because to say that people will not be affected is misleading. Yes, of course, everyone will be Pe affected a lot. Right, so I am a strong advocate of open, transparent co communication. Yes. You know, if you keep your communication open and transparent with your, with your teams, with your people, then acceptance of these new technologies 
will be a, a lot smoother. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Right? And uh, you know, human human beings are going to we as of right now we really don't have any clear indication, proven examples or enough examples to say how we humans will actually respond to a robot sitting in the next cubicle. <laughs> yeah, or, we don't simply we simply don't know, right? Or or a robot in my bedroom. Mm. Right? We really we really don't know or or, or a robot that is taking me uh, through an autonomous car to a mall mm. and then uh, some kind of a robot helping me through the mall and all that. Mm. Now, these are no longer science fiction uh, ideas. These are here. A lot of work is being done. It's already happening. Some of it is already here. But we do not yet have enough enough data points, enough examples, enough anecdotal stories to say how we humans will respond and react to these things. Mm, no. And that, that's why, that's especially for a corporation and an, an, an organization, I think, as you say, open and clear and, and, and uh, communication and dialogue around these things are very important as, uh, as this change can be uh, painful for, for parts of our organization. And then actually talking openly about that is, is just very important. Right. And, and I, I recently had a conversation with an executive and, and I was, when we were brainstorming, mm -hmm. one of the things that came up is, what happens when you have a robotic technology as a worker, but the robotic technology is working 24 seven? Yes, of course. But or humans are supposed to work eight hours a day by law mm -hmm. in various parts of the world, mm -hmm. um, eight, eight and a half hours, whatever the mm -hmm. case might be. Mm -hmm. So what happens in that case? Mm -hmm. Another thing that came up during during that brainstorming session is, you now if a robot or a robotic technology is more productive, mm. then what becomes the benchmark against which a human is measured? Mm. Mm. Right. So right now you and I are measured based on our own as human benchmarks. As human thing. benchmarks. So 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 these are important issues because. It affects how how will an organization evaluate your or my performance when, when there is a robotic technology also working side by side. Yeah, are we yeah. going to be still going to be evaluated based on us mm. or against the robotic mm. technology? Mm. Now these are these are complex issues. Mm. These are not, but these are issues that everybody will have to deal with. Yeah, you can't avoid it. You can't avoid it. So mm. the faster you start thinking about the next machine age, mm. learn about the next machine age, invest in it, mm. the, the better off you're going to be. The better off you're going to be because you're going to be wrestling with these issues. Mm. Very interesting. This has been a fantastic debate, uh, a fantastic conversation. And it's also, um, from another angle than I usually, I usually talk to robotics researchers, but I really love this of inventing the future and inventing the future you desire for your organization, for your company, for your community, not having it haphazardly happen. And also trying to um, look into benefits and, and possible challenges ahead of time and preparing for them. Right, absolutely. But thank you very much for doing an interview. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you, my pleasure. This episode is sponsored by Aptomica. Everything you need in modular robotics. Or robots up close. What's going on in robotics, online and on the road. If you like this interview, don't forget to subscribe, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to our email newsletter on robotsindepth.com. You can also support the show on Patreon.